it is my pleasure to be with you guys today. Um, I've got a lot of buttons they told me to turn on, yeah. so I'm going to try to do some of that. I've got so many wires here, if I fall in the baptistry, y'all come get me. I'll, I'll surely fry. And I try to use this thing as a, uh, as a whiteboard. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll soldier on without it. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and start in Matthew chapter 19. And we'll make some introductory remarks from there. We don't lie. I was speaking at a men's conference in Kentucky. And a guy was taking notes on one of these things, and I'd never seen one. And so after, at one of the breaks, I asked him what he was using, and he showed me this iPad. And it had this little pencil that wasn't a pencil. Well, I made a quick sketch on it, and I thought, well, that's just pretty slick. And then the next day at church, a deacon came to me and handed me this box and said, don't ask any questions. So he gave me this <laughs> iPad Pro. And, uh, well, I like to draw, so I've drawn a couple of children's books with it and illustrated some stuff. In fact, the last time I was in Conway, or the time before last, I was working on a book. I, I laid in the floor in Marty's office and drew, well, you guys did something at Styles Roofing. But uh, I've, I've used this as a tool and, and tried to, you know, since this guy was so gracious to give it to me, I tried to make it work. And instead of using PowerPoint, this works pretty good as a whiteboard sometimes. And we'll try to use it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be with you guys. Uh, I've been in private practice as a therapist for 25 years. Uh, on my own business, it's counseling and consulting. I do a lot of work with the corporate America. Uh, I do some work with universities. My primary consulting job is with the police department. I've been a chaplain with the Huntsville Police Department for about 32 years. Uh, it started out just being a chaplain, just showing up and hanging out. And it, it's turned into, I teach uh, de-escalation, crisis intervention, uh, trained as a negotiator. Uh, I, I'm assigned to their SWAT team. Uh, I have a Ninja Turtle vest, but no ammo. So if you see the guy on the big black truck, I'm the little guy in, in, the, in the vest with no bullets. And so, but uh, I teach at the academy on stress management and leadership. I goof around as a hobby with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for whatever reason, and they've let me now teach defensive tactics at the academy. So once a week I go, and nobody in that room is older than me, nobody in that room is smaller than me. So Tuesdays are hard days. Uh, so you'll hear me make references to stuff like that. Uh, I'm not a police officer, I'm not sworn, I'm not a shooter, I'm not an operator. I'm just a guy that I don't coach baseball. <laughs> That's not somebody, mine, I don't think. Somebody's right? vehicle. No, somebody's vehicle. Okay, that's, I was going to say, wow. Now, I've got a blood sugar monitor, and if it goes off, just let me go see Jesus. Keep your lips off of me. And just let me go. I don't want to be resuscitated. I don't you know. And so we'll go from there. So, so a couple of rules that you gave me to talk to a, a, a mixed group of folks about their marriages. Number one, we're going to try to use sound New Testament principles. And we're going to try to use sound psychological principles. Everything that is a sound psychological principle is in the New Testament. If it's not in the New Testament, it's not a sound psychological principle. That being said, I believe everything in the New Testament assumes the bell curve of normalcy. I believe there's an assumption that you're talking about two healthy people that are flawed. It, it's not how to deal with a narcissist, not how to deal with a sociopath, not how to deal with somebody who struggles with bipolar disorder, not what you should do in an addictive situation. I assume that when New Testament writers wrote these things, they said, hey, we're going to assume these people have enough self-control and enough self-insight that they're old enough to understand and obey the gospel. People who are mentally ill don't have to worry much about the gospel. God will not hold you accountable for that which you are not responsible for. And so there's, there's some parameters on this discussion that we're assuming, number one, we're under the bell curve of normalcy. If we talk about something and you go, yeah, I understand that principle, but I don't think that applies to me. This is probably not the venue to discuss it publicly. We may talk about it privately. Uh, the other part of this is that most of what was written in the New Testament about relationships was actually written about the church. Very few things are written about husbands and wives. There's a couple of isolated verses. Uh, but most of the, the relationships in the New Testament were arranged marriages. They didn't, get go out, they didn't get to go out and shop and find their spouse. 
You know, I have a daughter, you have camels. Let's make a deal. You know, all of a sudden. And, and so when Paul tells husbands love your wives and wives submit to your husbands, he was doing some radical stuff for the first century. Wives were essentially property. And Paul was saying, this is how you make the best of a bad situation. He does the same thing when he talks about slavery. Paul neither endorses nor condemns slavery. He said, but if you are a slave... Adopt these attitudes and behave this way. If you're a slave owner, adopt these attitudes and behave this way. So without trying to undo the social fabric of their culture, Paul said the impetus on Christians is to behave a certain way in the circumstance. Your circumstance does not dictate your behavior. And so we're going to talk a lot about controlling what we control and doing what we can do rather than focusing on, hey, what my spouse is doing. You're only in control of one of these things. And that's you. So let's start. Let's look at Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, they departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Now, if you're reading the New King James or the American Standard or the King James, you've got an extra word in your text. It says just any reason. Everybody see that? And just is italicized. Anytime you look at King James, New King James, American Standard, and you find an italicized word, it's been added by the translator. They want you to understand the gist of this question. The question in, in the original language is, can you divorce your wife for any reason? The question that they want you to understand is being asked is, can you divorce your wife for just any reason? There's two popular rabbis in the time of Jesus. One is named Shemai, one is named Hillel. Uh, they looked at this verse from Leviticus, and it says, if you are married to a woman and she becomes displeasing to you, for some unclean thing, you may put her away. Well, one of those rabbis camped out on if your wife becomes unpleasing to you. And that was it. That's where he built his camp. He said, if she becomes unpleasing, she burns the biscuits. She colors her hair. She cuts her hair. She redecorates the bathroom. If she does anything you don't like, you can be done with her. The other rabbi said, no, 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 no. You don't understand what Moses said. Moses said if she becomes displeasing to you for an unclean reason. And we're assuming that there's something going on here about sexual morality. This is not adultery because in the Old Testament she committed adultery. You just stone her. This was, did you find out she wasn't pure when you married her? Did you find out she had been prostituted by her father? Did you find out she'd voluntarily been a prostitute? Did you find out she wasn't a virgin? And so there's this big debate between what gives a man the right to put his wife away. And they ask Jesus this question. And you notice the text says they ask him this question, testing him. This is a disingenuous question. They don't really want to know the answer. They just want Jesus to step into a pothole. And the reason they're asking him this is because in, in the first century... You have this culture among the Jews where Judaism basically was manifested in about four major sects or sections. Um, not all of them, but the four major ones. Uh, you, you had the Essenes in, in Judaism. The Essenes were, and being politically incorrect, they were your Amish Jews. They really believed in the old ways. They didn't want their children to learn to speak Greek. They wanted their children to only speak Hebrew. They didn't want their children to read the Septuagint, which was a, a Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. They wanted them reading just the, the writings of the Old Testament. We believe these people lived in a community outside Jerusalem called Qumran. And we believe it is the Qumran community that preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. When they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1962, they found a copy of the book of Isaiah that was 1,500 years older than anything we'd ever discovered. And there might have been seven differences from that scroll and the current scroll. And those differences were not words but letters. So these people that were really, really strict in how they interpreted the old traditions and the old laws. Another group of, of people in, in first century Judaism were the Zealots. Now the Zealots were your concealed carry Jews. They would have the Star of David and a rebel flag on it. You know, they believed that the Romans had no business being in Palestine. And they thought when the Messiah came, that the Messiah was going to be a warrior. 
that Messiah was going to lead a rebellion and they're going to, they're going to get their concealed carry weapons and when you pry from my cold dead hands, Malone Labe, they're going to fight the, the, the Romans. And, and that's what they were looking for. They were looking for the Messiah to be a military leader. When Jesus feeds the 5,000 and they divide them up and they set them in companies, well, they're military companies. And you notice when that big crowd is around Jesus and they think he's the Messiah and he does this miracle with the food, they, they count the men. They don't count the women. How many men we got here? Why? Well, they're looking for some kind of military action. When Jesus rides into town the week before the crucifixion and the resurrection, they're lining the streets and they're putting palm fronds down and they're yelling, Hosanna! Hosanna! And, and we use Hosanna as a praise term. Hosanna in its original meaning was save. So they're yelling, save, save now, save, save now. And they want him to ride into Jerusalem and start a war. I personally, and I'm chasing a rabbit now, I think that's probably why Judas betrayed him. This guy's talking about love your neighbors. This guy's talking about peace and love. This guy's talking about all this stuff. If the Romans come and arrest him, he's going to have to fight. And I'll start this thing. I'll get this show rolling. I'm tired of you piddling around. And then Judas, when he sees that he has been condemned, he had no idea that Jesus would ever be condemned. Judas, when he saw that he was condemned, repented and threw the money back. But these guys are yelling for Jesus to start a war. When he rides into town on a colt, telling them out loud, symbolically, I'm a king who's coming in peace. If he had ridden in town on a, on a, on a horse or on a stallion, on a charger, that had been a different deal. But, but the zealots wanted this battle to take place and wanted the Messiah to be a military leader. And then you get a group of guys in the New Testament called the Sadducees. The Sadducees believed that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were inspired. They didn't believe the rest of the Old Testament was inspired. Uh, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They did not believe in angels and demons and spirits. They believed that when you were dead, you were like Rover, you were dead all over. And so everything that they valued was present. And so they were the aristocracy. They believed that wealthy people were righteous and righteous people were wealthy. And if you were poor or sick or had a disease, that was just a mark that you weren't pleasing to God. That's why you get these questions, hey, who sinned this man or his parents he was born blind? That's why you, you get this. It, it's basically in our society called moralistic therapeutic deism. We believe that if we say our prayers and attend church, then our diagnosis will come back negative and we'll be wealthy and our houses won't get hit by the storm. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. But the Sadducees believe that. They control the temple treasury and they also were in charge of buying and selling the high priesthood from the Romans in the first century. And then you get this group, this group of guys called the Pharisees. And it's very interesting that, that uh, Matthew points out that the guys asking this question are the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the elite. They were the, the meritocracy. They believed you earned your way to heaven by dotting your I's and crossing your T's. And if you didn't do it the way they did it, you did it wrong. They had developed a system of interpreting the old law where it was in the minutia. They really began to worship the law more than the lawgiver. Uh, I've got a commentary at my house that my wife bought me, and it's a copy of the Mishnah. The Mishnah is 800 different interpretations on the Ten Commandments. You got Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments weren't very complicated. In fact, sometimes the Ten Commandments are called the Decalogue. Because it really doesn't say, Thou shalt not murder. It says, No murder. No adultery. There's not any stuttering here. They came up with 800 different interpretations from the other rabbis about what these things meant. Now, the copy I have was written, was translated from Hebrew into German and from German into English. And it sounds like Jedi Master Yoda wrote it. <laughs> when it, when it talks about the, the Sabbath it, uh, on goings ins and comings outs is what it talks about. And, and it, was, it was minute stuff. So the Pharisees are really into, hey, what are the, the, the minutia of the law? They believe Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were inspired. They believe that the wisdom literature was inspired. They believe the minor prophets were inspired. The major prophets were inspired. And they believe the sayings of the rabbis were inspired. They believe that everything in the Mishnah came ex cathedra. It was spoken from God through a rabbi. And now you've got this rabbi who says this. And you've got this rabbi who says that. That's a problem. 
Because if both these guys are inspired, how can one guy be so wrong and one guy be so right? So they're asking Jesus, hey, comment on these two schools of thought. Now, the, the very conservative rabbi was Shemai. Shemai said the only way you put your wife away is if she's guilty of some unclean thing. I remembered that because the liberal guy was Hillel. Because that's where he was going, straight to Hillel. I, I remember that for the test. And so they asked Jesus this question. And in order for him to answer this question, he's going to alienate half the audience. He's going to endorse his position. And it's a I got you moment. So what does Jesus say? So they ask him this disingenuous question. They want him to pick between one of these schools of thought. And so Jesus answers in verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read... First of all, I'm not worried about a rabbi. I'm not worried about a school of thought. I'm not worried about this guy. I, I, I'm worried about the law of Moses. Have you not read? And what we're reading is what the guy who made people said. Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning... So listen, when, when I answer this question, I'm not going to talk about Shimei, I'm not going to talk about Hillel, and I'm really not actually talking about Moses. I'm talking about the guy Moses quoted when he wrote. Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female, and for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus starts out from the beginning and simply says, let me talk about the ideal. Now, you're talking about why or when can a person divorce. He goes, the guy who invented marriage said it's not designed to be separated. Now, there's going to be some exceptions. But we're probably not going to talk about very many of those. He, he says, when, when you talk about the design for marriage, it wasn't when can you divorce or why can you... He says, the guy who designed marriage said you get one man, one woman for life. And what God puts together, you actually don't have the authority to separate. You can make up all the reasons you want, but you really can't supersede what the guy who invented this thing did. Now... There are some exceptions. There's some New Testament endorsed exceptions. But the ideal is that two become one. And biblical math is not one plus one equals two. Biblical math is not two halves equal a whole. Biblical math is one plus one equals one. <laughs> And that's the design. That's what we're going to talk about in the next couple of sessions and, and tomorrow too. Of what it takes for us to have that oneness. The word we use in our society is intimacy. And don't let that be a, a, a connotation of just sexual intimacy. It's the idea where two healthy people do what they can to combine their health. Now, if you're in the audience and you're here because, hey, I might get married and I want to hear some stuff. Then please understand that the pattern for marriage is not... I'm unhappy and I need you to make me happy. That, that, that's a bad formula. The pattern is I'm happy, you're happy, and we're going to combine our happiness. I'm healthy, you're healthy, we're going to combine our health. Because anything else makes one of you a fixer-upper. Makes one of you dependent on the other person. It allows you to say, I'm not happy, I'm not successful, and it's your fault. Well, if I can make you unhappy, I can make you happy. If I can make you fail, I can make you succeed. If I can make you cheat, I can make you faithful. If I can make you drink, I can make you sober. If I can make you kill yourself, I can keep you alive. So, so not only will I not be responsible for things I don't control, I'm unwilling to let other people control things that don't belong to them. So Jesus says the ideal for the marriage pattern is you've got a healthy, wholesome person, another healthy, wholesome person, and when they combine, they become this one. They have this unity. And I think we all at least gave lip service to that when we first got married. With a, we're going to create this unity. And then what happens is a flawed person, an imperfect person, marries an imperfect person. And what do you think happens in that result? I'm going to take two broken pieces and put them together and fix the whole thing, right? No, that requires a lot of engineering. That requires a lot of work. So we talk about this marriage go-around. And we'll, we'll try to, to do this. You can envision this. But the marriage go-around works like this. When the marriage go-around starts out, it starts out 
with romance. And in romance, everybody's happy. This is the thing where this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. This person is Prince Charming. You know much about knights in shining armor? They didn't bathe a lot. Armor was hot. It was heavy. They wore a wool jacket and then chain mail and then the plates. And it took a lot of effort to take it off. And when you finally took off that armor, guess what? It was a dumpster fire. Okay? And that white horse he wears poops in the house. Okay? And so all of a sudden we start looking at romance. But what happens is very, very quickly romance turns into reality. And when romance turns into reality, that's when you get this disappointment phase. Now, reality is basically the idea that, that all the things that I thought about when I was in limerence, all the things that I thought about when I was Twitter-pated, all the things that I thought about when I had infatuation, they kind of come crashing in. Everybody sees the red flags when they're dating. We just give them a different color. Okay? Uh, there's a, a, a test I use in my office called the Simbus exam. Simba stands for saving your marriage before it starts. And it talks about this person's characteristics and that person's characteristics. And then it says, but when you get into conflict, the very thing you thought was attractive to this person now is irritating from this person. See, a person in the romance stage says, my boyfriend is a foreign national. And he's unencumbered by the mores of a capitalistic society. Doesn't that just give you goose pimples? You want to go watch him on Hallmark, Right. Then they get married. And this foreign national who's unencumbered by Catholic society is an illegal alien who's unemployed. <laughs> okay, that's reality. We cover that stuff really, really different. This person is spontaneous. They can't make a plan to save their life. Mm -hmm. This person is so carefree. They keep a nasty house. And all of a sudden, the very thing that we thought was great and charming, when you live with it, when Prince Charming takes off his armor, you realize, oh, wow, there's a human under this, and they're flawed. So you go from romance, this idea of, now, I don't know, and we'll talk about this later, but I don't know how many times I've sat down with somebody and, and, and said, well, tell me about a time in your marriage when you were happy. And they we've never been happy. Hmm. Well, if you've never been happy and you married them, that's a special kind of stupid. I can't do anything with that. I can't fix that. Okay? You get a chance to say, hey, I thought it was going to be like this. This was romance and then reality. Well, when reality sets in, you have three options. Option number one is, is you can recycle. And that's what we do when we're dating. We go, oh, this is not working out. I'll get somebody else. This is not working out. I'll try somebody else. Now, young people, if you're not married and you're dating, this is the only time in your Christianity you're allowed to be selfish. It's the only time as a Christian you can say, this is what I want, and if it ain't that, I ain't selling. Now, have a little moderation there, but you really do get to say, this is ideal, this is unacceptable, what's it closer to, and I'm only going to pick what, what fixes this. Because once you say I do, once you make that commitment, recycle is, is usually out of the question. But a lot of people get into relationships, and in our society, you know, the divorce rate is, is higher than 50%. Because our society recycles. Find somebody that will make you happy. Find somebody that will make you happy. Uh, I work with a guy. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a decent gentleman. Uh, he's a, a ranger. Uh, he's on our SWAT team. And he teases the young guys. He goes, oh, so you're on your, your starter wife. Where do you get your permanent wife? <laughs> and uh, Tony, that's not the way this works. <laughs> but in his mind, it's just a natural thing to recycle. Now, sometimes people go, okay, here's, here's romance and it's turned into reality. And I can't get out of it. Or I'm unwilling to get out of it. And then so what they do is they live in resentment. And that's, well, this is terrible. We're going to stay together for the sake of the kids. Well, let me be bold enough to say you're not doing your kids any favor if you live in a relationship and you have a sham of a marriage. You need to be honest. Hey, we're struggling. Hey, we're honest. And, and, and we, but, but to simply live with two people that are miserable and are selfish and are antagonistic and are mean and cruel and manipulative, what do you teach? What, what good are you doing your kids? 
a, a lot of times people say, well, this is just, this is just the way it is. It's not going to get any better. And that's a terrible, terrible way to live. And, but a lot of folks, because of what we teach about divorce and because of what God talks about the permanence of marriage, instead of fixing the thing, we just decide to drive the thing like it is. Uh, preachers talk to each other and we kind of have these things that, you know, they, they come up so often in conversation. And my buddy Tim Orberson, I've worked in the same town with him for over 30 years. He likes to tell the story of these two guys working on a house and they're framing it up and they're on top of this house and the worker looks at his boss and says, hey, you know, this thing doesn't have any braces on it. He, I realize this doesn't have any braces on it. He goes, what are we going to do if it falls? And the boss says, ride it to the ground. <laughs> well, that's not what you're designed to do with your marriage. We don't want you living in a place where you're just full of resentment and this is never going to be good and I'm never going to be happy and they're never going to change and I'm just going to live in resentment. You can recycle. Or you can live in the doldrums. You can live in this resentment. Or, and I really don't know if you, you want to talk about reinvest or renovate. But when you do that, you start learning the skills that it takes to build a strong marriage. Now when we talk about building a strong marriage. We're going to talk about this little thing. That I call the marriage pyramid. I don't know if you remember the food pyramid from middle school. If you can draw that pyramid. That's worth a dollar a sheet by the way. Because everybody can't draw a, a, a two sided triangle. But you remember the food pyramid. I don't remember what it was supposed to be. But the latest thing in nutrition is. Uh, in Dr. Fung's book, the, the, the Obesity Code, he said that's the worst nutrition plan ever invented by humans. And I don't remember what it was, but I think it was ice cream, pizza, french fries, I don't remember. But I use this for the, for, for the marriage pyramid. At the very top of this thing is love. That's the capstone. Now you don't start there, you end there. And love is an attitude, not an emotion. Love is a choice not a feeling. Love is not a feeling you feel when you feel a feeling you feel you never felt before. That's when you grab hold of a hot fence, you can get that. Okay? That fades very, very quickly. That's that's the romance part. And that has to be there. I, I know a lot of people, and, and especially from our Christian colleges, uh, they meet each other on campus and it's got a, a subculture of spirituality and this person is not actually real but pretending to be very righteous and, 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 and very spiritual and it looks good on paper. You go to church, I go to church, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian, my parents are Christian, your parents are Christians. You like mission work, I like mission work, let's get married. And there's no romance, there's no chemistry. That can work, but it typically doesn't. But in that first part is, is, is the romance, but that romance has to leave that feeling, that tingly feeling, and become a choice, become a decision. It has to become intentional. Uh, I didn't invent this definition, but I like it. Love is the intentional and if necessary personally costly investment into the good of another that's part one love is the intentional <coughs> choice and if necessary it cost me something love is the intentional and if necessary personally costly investment into the good of another part one part two it does not require reciprocity I choose to love you when you're unlovable. I choose to love you when you can't do anything for me. I choose to love you because I've made a commitment and an investment into you. And you're, oh, you, you, you do that with, with kids. You have to choose to love a two-year-old. Anybody got one of those at their house? That's why animals eat their young. Okay? <laughs> but you have to, no, I'll do it myself. No. And you have to choose to love a 14-year-old. The two-year-old brain and the teenage brain are almost the same. The two-year-old brain growing at a rapid rate. The teenage brain grows at an unbelievable astronomical rate. A teenager is a two-year-old that can drive <laughs> and is obsessed with sex. Okay? That's, and that's all you... But we choose to love the 14-year-old. We choose to love the two-year-old. You can choose to love a grown adult. I love you when you... When you're not lovable. I love you when you're not giving me anything back. I love you because I've made an investment into us. And you'll find out that's when the wheels come off is the difference between us and me. 
Love is the intentional and, if necessary, personally costly investment into the good of another. It does not require reciprocity. And then part three, and it is not necessary that the person being loved deserve it. I love you when you're unlovable. I love you when you make mistakes. I love you when you're flawed. Now, we give lip service to the fact that we were created with the potential for imperfection. Well, what do you do when a person who's created with the potential for imperfection lives up to their potential? Mm-hmm. What do you think you're getting? We got a new puppy at our house. Well, guess what you sign up for when you get a puppy? Things get chewed on. Things get pulled off the counter. Things appear in the floor that shouldn't be in the floor. They, they don't want to sleep in the kennel. They want to sleep with you. If you got... A hundred dollars worth of plastic toys for them to chew on, but they want your shoe. Okay? Well, why is this dog acting this way? Well, you're the one that brought a puppy here. I, I got what I brought into the house. I married an imperfect person. My wife married an imperfect person. I live in a neighborhood with imperfect people. I go to church with imperfect people. I work with imperfect people, and I'm self-employed. I'm the only dude in the building. Okay? When you when somebody lives up to their potential and they are imperfect, we use it as an excuse to stop. We quit church. We don't invest in our marriages. That person is not perfect. I'm done. Imperfection is not the reason to stop loving. It's the occasion for love to be present. Because love is the intention. And if necessary personally costly investment to the good of another. It doesn't require reciprocity and it doesn't require that you deserve being loved. That's the attitude. Going. Now, how do you get that attitude? That attitude comes from, from this little thing that we call intimacy. And intimacy is not just sexuality, but it's that connection. It, it, it's the idea that if this circle represents me and this circle represents you, when we engage with each other, I've got some barriers around me. I got some things that I don't want you to know. I got some things that I don't want you to see. Now, gentlemen, your wife falls in love with you because those layers go away and you talk to her. Women build intimacy by talking. Men build intimacy by doing. And as you share your hopes and your dreams and your fears, you begin to eliminate these barriers. And eventually it looks like this. And then eventually it's supposed to look like this. <clears throat> and to the degree that those two circles overlap, you have a strong marriage and you have intimacy. But we start, we, we start here. We're supposed to end here. But more often, we end up doing this after we get married. Hmm. Because you come back in and in order to insulate your wife from what's going on at work, you isolate her. In order to insulate your kids from stress and worry and financial fears, you, you isolate. But you, you can't retrograde. So in order for me to love you, we've got to have this oneness. We've got to have this connection. Two become one. And, and that's what this represents right here is, is the oneness. The idea that I'm here, you're here, and one plus one equals one, not one plus one equals two. So love, that, that attitude really can only take place in a marriage when I have this connectedness. When I have this bonding, when I have this, this intimacy. And intimacy is built on trust. And this is probably where the rubber meets the road. Because how is trust built? How do you build trust? We could probably just open up the forum and talk about trust. And most of us in our minds are defining trust by using trust. How do you decide who you trust? And how do you become a person who is trustworthy? It's an interesting, interesting discussion. You know, when I first started in, 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 in my private practice and a couple would come and, and, and he's talked to somebody he shouldn't talk to or he'd been with somebody he shouldn't been with or she spent money she shouldn't spend and, and, and trust has been broken. And you bring this little couple in and you start talking, let's rebuild trust. Most people don't know how trust works. How do you decide who you trust? And how do you become a person of trust? Do you know? We, hey, this person's behavior, this person's track record. All those things are absolutely accurate, but they're nebulous. 
we define trust by talking about trust. There is one key marker that determines whether or not you trust me. And there's one key marker that determines whether or not I trust you. And that's the foundation of all our relationships. And it's to the degree that you are selfish or selfless. And that's it. When you're in the romance stage, you're selfless. And when you get in the reality stage, you're selfish. And if we stay selfish, then you don't trust me because I'm only doing what I want for me. And I don't trust you. And then when it's self against self, then there's no intimacy. And if there's no intimacy, then there's no connectedness. We're divided. <coughs> then there's no love. And I decide to trust you when you are selfless. And if I want to be trusted, I've got to be the guy who's selfless. You know, let's suppose you go down here to buy a new truck. Everybody's had to buy a new vehicle, right? And that guy comes out on the lot and he needs to sell a truck. You're going to need that guy, right? Well, I'd like a black four-door short bed to come. Well, I've got a Ford F-150 right here that would be just fine for you. No, no, no. I said a black short bed four-door Tacoma. Because the last Tacoma I drove has 437,000 miles on it. I want the one. I, 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 no, but I got this F. No, no, you don't understand. I, I've got one that runs just fine. I had to buy a new one when I got grandkids. My daughter said I couldn't haul the grandkids around in that one. And uh, so when I picked up my new truck, this kid says, Now, Mr. Jones, I need to give you an orientation on your truck. I said, Son, I've been driving a truck longer than you've been alive. He goes, The last time you bought a truck, you've been stuff invented since then. So I, I, <laughs> but you go down there, and there's the guy that needs to sell a truck. Or you go down there to that guy and says, Hey, what kind of truck you need? You're going to be off road? You're going to haul deer in it? You're going to pull a boat? You're going to pull a trailer. You're going to feed cattle with it. What do you need in a truck? That's a different buying experience, isn't it? See, the guy who needs to sell a truck is thinking about him. The guy who wants me to have the truck I need is thinking about me. And that's an interesting thing because when we get into marriage, we tend to become self-absorbed and not self-aware. We become self-absorbed and not other aware. I got to hear Muriel Hemingway speak. That's the granddaughter of Ernest Hemingway. And as we were sitting in the audience, she was talking about the idea of connectivity in society and people isolating themselves. And she just had to spell the word illness. We spelled it out loud. I-L-L-N-E-S-S. -S. And then she had to spell the word wellness. W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S. -S. And she said the difference in illness and wellness is I versus we. Well, I began to play with that. I like stuff like that. The difference in unite and untie is where you put the I. And all of a sudden, when we start talking about how to make my marriage work, how to make my relationship in the church work, how to get along with my extended family, how to get along with my in-laws, how to deal with my adult children, how to deal with anybody, is really going to boil down to whether or not people perceive me as selfish or not. It's really going to boil down to whether or not people view me as somebody that they can trust. And do they trust me because I'm willing to be sacrificial in my relationships. So when we talk about the marriage go around and you get romance and romance turns into reality. You can recycle. You can live in resentment. Or you can reinvest or renovate. And the way to do that is to start changing the way I interact with me. And the way I interact with me will greatly have an influence on how I interact with you. Uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute break, and we're going to come back and talk about how we deal with crisis and conflict based on the concept of selfishness or selflessness. Uh, any instructions? All right, take a 10-minute break, and we'll be right back. Thanks.